Well, welcome, welcome Chris Nussbaum to Aaron's Opinion. I wanted to just start by telling you how thrilled I am uh, to have you. Um, and my first question is, we were talking a lot last night about just everything under the sun. And I really, really appreciated that conversation. That really inspired me as a, as a podcaster to talk to you more. So who is my first question? And then we'll just springboard into it from here. Who is Chris Newsbomb? Well, thank you, Aaron, for having me, first of all. Uh, it's My pleasure. a real pleasure to uh, be here. Thanks for the invitation, and I'm looking forward to a fun conversation with you. Uh, so who am I? Well, um, I'm a pretty multifaceted person, I would like to think. Um, I am, first of all, uh, somebody who is devoted to my faith, to uh, my family, uh, to friends. I'm also somebody who enjoys uh, helping others to try to do my part to help them be the best version of themselves. I'm a musician, so I am also a, a lover of listening to music, so I uh, really enjoy music and find that to be a big part of my life and uh, also a big part of my life and something that has been a passion of mine for as long as I can remember which I think will be the focus of much of our conversation today is broadcasting and particularly radio uh, first it was radio uh, of itself and and I think that was there because when I was little and first listening to the radio there wasn't really such a thing as podcasting and then as podcasting came about uh, podcasting really became something else that I was and still am interested in it just opens up a whole new uh, platform, as you know, as a podcaster, it uh, opens up a, a lot of new possibilities. And so um, that's a part of me that really um, is important. And so I think uh, that describes me uh, in a nutshell. Okay. And going back to our conversation, because we really started, we really started to geek out very quickly when I mentioned, yes, we did. when I mentioned, I, I, I wasn't even prepared for that, but I'm, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, you know, the truth is most people, when you call them, most people are not like us, Chris, most people are not willing to put <laughs> up with the geeking out and really get into it with people. Most people aren't willing to, 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 to put up with that, but I, I totally am the same way and I totally understand you. So what was your first memory of radio? My first memory of radio was, uh, listening to it with my parents in the car. Uh, I grew up primarily on country music just because it was what my family listened to. And growing up in the north central part of Maryland, so uh, suburban Baltimore, um, we listened to a lot of WPOC, which is a legendary uh, country station in this area, going back to the early 1970s and it's always kept the same format which is uh, very uncommon as radio stations are concerned uh, so the first voice i ever remember hearing on the radio uh, was that of Lori de young who is the iconic morning show host on wpoc she's been on the same station, waking Baltimore up uh, for 35 years now, which is unheard of. Um, and 
she was always somebody and still is somebody who I have associated with radio and like everything that a broadcaster should be and is. Um, so uh, as I was telling you last night, uh, I'm involved with in different capacities now as an occasional contributor. I used to be a, a regular co-host. Now I occasionally contribute to a show called Radio Connection Live. It used to be a live show and now it's a podcast. And uh, recently uh, that team had the opportunity to interview Lori and I got to lead that interview. That was an absolute dream. Um, but anyway, that was my first memory. And then later on, uh, I went on from that to expand to other forms of radio. Um, my parents owned a furniture store and we bought out, uh, airtime for our commercials on WCBA 100.7 The Bay which is a classic rock station in Baltimore so uh, that was my first exposure to the behind the scenes part of radio because I'd go down to the studio and I'd actually record some of the ads so I was fascinated by just watching the people down there cut the ads um and then here comes talk radio and i don't know what you want to get into there but i i want i want you to i want yeah. you to keep you're going in the right direction okay okay good yeah um my <clears throat> my um uh, aunt uh when i would go to her house had wfmd which is also a legendary station, but has had different formats over the years. That's a station in Frederick, Maryland. They're a talk radio station. She'd have them on in the kitchen. And um, I would kind of eavesdrop on that station. They had people like Dr. Laura, Laura Schlesinger, and Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck on there. And so I would start to listen to them and just became, yeah. I, yeah. I became increasingly fascinated with them. So um, really my horizons uh, expanded since then. But my first uh, memory of radio was listening to Lori as I got ready for school on WPOC. Yeah. Yeah, that's so that's so touching. That that really is, you know, and it, it goes to show that the work that we do in podcasting, YouTube, radio, it apparently has an impact. It does. It apparently has a major impact on people's lives, and it's a positive one. And I think there's a ton of great life lessons that can be learned from that. But one of them for sure is that anytime we can have a positive influence. Let's have a positive influence on someone's life today. Really, it, mm -hmm. it might be a real. That might be an excellent idea. I remember when I was a little boy, my and I'm 30 years old. My uh, and it is it's so it's so inspirational because you're 23. You're my brother's age, but we have we have all of the all of the same interests and and all of the same you know perspective on life. It's it's really inspir. It's really fascinating to me, Chris. Um, because I, when I was a little boy in the '90s, my mother, my mother would listen to to the doc, you know to to Doctor Laura, and my father would listen to Rush, and <laughs> and so those were the two first people that really philosophically made me aware of of a, of a radio show. Not understanding it, of course, but being aware that you can have a voice in the community, and I think that's what really inspired me. Ironically speaking, I, I my entire life. I've always loved to, 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 to talk and to have a conversation. And I think probably listening to talk radio as a small child showed me how to talk. And, and it was an example of how you can use your voice, the voice that God gave us. So yeah. I really think that whether I'm aware of it today, well, actually, probably the fact that I have a podcast today in a lot of ways is because I was exposed to talk radio as a small child. I mean, I'm talking three, four, five years old. 
you know, exposed to hearing someone talk. So, yeah. and then a, in a comment, sure, a comment sure. about sure, sure. that. Yeah. Um, first of all, mm -hmm. <laughs> you you mention uh, Dr. Laura and Rush. In some ways, those were two very different shows that dealt with two very different issues, and yes. in some ways, they were similar. Mm -hmm. Um, because though uh, Laura Schlesinger was and is, because she's still on uh, Sirius XM, a radio psychologist, so she deals with people's personal problems, uh, people who choose, for better or worse, to air their personal problems on national radio <laughs> um so guys you're you're chris let me let me lead let me lead the listener a little bit so yeah, yeah most yeah. people our age wouldn't really understand it the um the dr laura show on the radio to my memory was kind of like um radio counseling therapy so Sort of. It was like people would call in with their, and, and the big word that I remember as a child, dilemmas. People yes. would call in with their dilemmas. She, there was a fixation of dilemma. And people would call in with dilemmas. And people mm -hmm. would talk about their dilemmas. 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 Yes, that was the word that they used back in the 90s. People, guys, people in the 90s, for anyone who's younger than us, people in the 90s actually spoke very differently. And they used a lot more British words in the 90s. So they used the word dilemmas at that time. It mm -hmm. was like, yeah, it was like a, a call-in help show where people would call in with their dilemmas and she would talk and counsel people sort yeah. of. Um, but yeah, it was a... There, but, and and yes, there yes. was a whole... There was a whole um subgenre of mm -hmm. talk radio um that that was especially popular in the 80s and 90s uh you know she wasn't the only one but she has been um the one who has uh, seemed to survive the longest but anyway you know where rush obviously was um a current events political talk show with a conservative uh, leaning but what made them similar was they both uh, dealt with interacting with the everyday person um, and so when you talk about listening to uh, talk radio as uh, something that taught you how to talk, how to how to interact. I can relate to that, but in a slightly different way than you might think. Because talking on the radio just when you're doing a monologue is a different style than when you're having everyday conversation. But it is uh, something really fascinating to listen to how hosts interact with callers who aren't um, experienced or trained, if you will, to talk on the radio, but they just, if, if they're good callers, they'll just talk like they're having a conversation and uh, the hosts do the same. And so, yeah, um, it does, if we do observe it for some time, it does teach us a lot about how people work and uh, how we can expect to uh, interact with people uh, around us and just kind of the human condition as a whole, I think. And as a matter of fact... You know, for for I, I have to give a disclaimer. Um, anyone is welcome here at Aaron's Opinion. You don't need to be professional to talk to me. You just have to love talking. And yeah. you just have to love talking. But you know where I'm going to want to lead the conversation. I'm not. <laughs> you're you're extremely prof you're you're you're, well, you're you're more professional than me. You're extremely well, professional. Thank you. 
<laughs> you're you're extre- and I'm extremely appreciative to to have this privilege to speak to you today. But what I do want to know is, well, one day in the you were working in some studio and you, you had an interesting call. Why just uh, only only at the expense of of humor? Why don't, why don't you enlighten us about that particular call, the one that you told me about about last night? Uh, are you talking about the call I screened? Uh, yeah, you got it. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm no, I'm not going to let this go. So go. Okay, so um, we'll get to we'll get to the, the effect of um, stories like this. What what came of the two days that I spent uh, working with uh, working with and at. Uh, WLNI in Lynchburg, Virginia, when you want to get to that. But the story that you're referring to is um, I was doing some um, hands-on training and uh, interview work at a station that uh, does talk radio, 105.9 WLNI, down in Lynchburg, Virginia, where I went to college. Uh I went to the University of Lynchburg, which is where I graduated from uh, in May. Anyway, I was down there a few weeks ago doing that, and one of the things I did was I sat in um, on the production of their morning show, and their producer allowed me to screen a couple calls. The first one I did, the first one I screened, um, I picked up the phone, you know, good morning, WLNI. And the guy said, yeah, uh, would you tell Brian he sounds like a moron? Now, Brian is one of the co-hosts of that morning show. So at this point, I'm trying to suppress my laughter because I'm on the phone with this guy and I'm trying to, like, you know, get his information and what he wants to talk about so I can determine whether or not he's, uh, you know, the term is airworthy or not. Um, Airworthy meaning whether he's, uh, whether whether I should put him on the air or not. And um, so (laughs) I just said, uh, well, what makes you say that? And uh, he said something about something he disagreed with Brian on about uh, the topic that they were currently talking about. So I had to make a quick decision. Either I was going to protect Brian from the name-calling that this caller was engaging in, or I was going to allow the caller to have a little fun with Brian. So I said, all right, I'll put, them, I'll put you on hold and um, see if they'll take you, Brian and Mary. See if they'll take you. So I put them on hold, and um, I texted into the studio. Is what you do when you get a caller on hold, is you text the um, studio, and you tell them the caller's name and what line they're on and what they want to talk about. So I said, I forget the guy's name, but I'll use the word, I'll use the name Bob. uh, I said, Bob, line four, Brian is a moron about (laughs) blank topic. Uh, Even though you told the story, it's it's even funnier. This this is still hilarious. It is. So... (laughs) I am, ne- so, by the, I am never letting, the, I am never going to let this go. In case you're wondering, am I going to forget? No, I'm not. So yes, so and, and, this, and the saga so, continues. Go ahead. So at this point, the caller is on hold, and Anthony, their producer, and I are laughing hysterically. And we're like, is he actually going to do this? Please, Brian, come on, just take the call. So um, they go to commercial break, and Brian... Uh, hadn't checked the um, screen yet, but Mary, his co-host, uh, reads the screen, <laughs> and she says, "Hey, Brian, there's a caller on line four who says you're a moron." 
I think I'm going to take him. And Brian's like, oh, dear God. So... <laughs> Um, Mary texted me at that point and said, good call. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that humor, you didn't add that punchline in the cut. That's even yeah. better. You enhanced that cut. Okay, this is a comedy routine. That's, yeah, no, that is hilarious. That's great. So, <laughs> so we come back from break and Mary actually took the call and um, of course, I'm laughing because Brian has no idea what he's getting himself into and um, or actually what he's getting himself into, what more accurately, what Mary just put him into. <laughs> um, but it's, but and, I mean, what it comes down to is I, I'm, I'm an English teacher. So this yeah. is an expression in English called throwing Brian under the bus. So exactly. Brian, so basically what I mean, you know, we don't really, really want to admit this. You don't have, I mean, you don't have to put this on your CV, but you know, you kind of threw the host under the butt. You kind of like hung him out to dry, kind of on purpose. I mean, you can say it was an accident, but it was kind of. I on put purpose. the call. On that. Well, <laughs> sort of. I put the call on hold, but Mary could have decided. Mary or Brian. That's true. Could have That's true. That that they were take... Okay, fine. It's Mary's fault, right? Yeah, okay. Anything, so, anyway. no, if anything, yeah. Mary put Brian under the bus. That's that's oh. true. Actually, yes. Mary threw Mary threw Brian under the bus. <laughs> yes. So, so um. <laughs> This so then um, I got to watch the, <coughs> the uh, exchange between Brian and the caller unfold, and it was radio greatness. Um, I wish I had the recording of it. Unfortunately, I do not. But it was. I'm great. sure you know what, and I'm sure WLNI does. Um, oh, I they know, do. I know that obviously, without knowing me personally, they wouldn't just give me that that sound clip, but. Um, I I am suspicious that soon they will Mary and Brian will know who Aaron oh, Tapini yeah. is. I, I have a yeah. suspicion. So yeah. In so fact, what? I'm and pretty then what, sure it's on their podcast. If we go back far enough, it's on their podcast. Okay, that's that is hilarious. Well, anyway, so how did this? <laughs> so, but I mean, I think I think it's also important to show the full spectrum of of, of the whole. You know, both sides of the story. So specifically, and and there's a lot of life lessons here. Why did Bob think Brian is a moron? Um, Bob thought Brian was a moron basically because Mary was pressing Brian on whether or not he supported a local school system in uh, re-implementing their mask mandate and Brian rather than saying yes or no was giving a lot of non-answers basically and um <laughs> i wouldn't have said <clears throat> excuse me i wouldn't have said that he sounded like a moron however as a talk show host and as somebody who does this for a living my not very experienced opinion, but my experience, my my opinion as a listener was, uh, dude, that doesn't make you look that good. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I mean, what do you think we as? Whoops. Uh, oh, okay. I hope Ryan isn't going to hear this later. <laughs> So what do you think we as podcasters, talk show hosts, what do you think we can learn from this call? I think there's a couple great life lessons. One is I think one, one is very obvious, one is less obvious. I think the most important thing is if you have agreed to host uh, excuse me, if you're gonna um, host a talk show, that's based on current events and you're gonna agree to engage in debate with your co-host and your listeners if either one of them or both of them presses you on whether or not you support something at least come out and say whether you do or don't uh, just own your views whether or not they agree or disagree with you, 
if they disagree with you, that makes good radio because then you get to have fun conversations. Um, if they agree with you, that's good because, okay, then you get people that agree with you and you get to find out if there's listener support behind you. But if you give, you know, very unclear answers, that, for one thing, kind of makes you sound like a politician, kind of noncommittal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and, yeah, it's just, um, I don't know, it's just, that that's just not the format of that kind of uh, genre of radio. And uh, I, I, I don't, that's the most important thing to me. I'm not sure. Um, what's the other thing you have in mind? I'm curious. Sure, that to be a successful broadcaster, you have to have a sense of humor. That's very true. <laughs> you have to be. You have to be willing to be comfortable to laugh at a lot to, to laugh with people and to laugh about things like that. And yet, you have to have the confidence to turn a serious situation into a situation of humor and grace, right? And so and that's I think, a big and, thing. And I think that's what Mary had. Right. And has that sense of humor, which let, I mean, she, of course she likes Brian. She's been working with Brian forever. Um, but she found the humor in a caller coming out to the screener and saying, Brian sounds like a moron. And she's like, oh, this will be fun. So she decides, hey, I'm going to take this. <laughs> <clears throat> So I think that is really important to go about life with with a sense of humor. So I, while we're on the topic of, you know, WLNI, um, what can you tell us? <clears throat> because there are a lot of blind people who want to get into podcasting, broadcasting, content creation, <clears throat> and don't. What... What advice do you have? Or really, how does someone get involved in the radio side? Um, because I think our listeners are very curious about this. Well, first, a little background. Um, sure. So my journey with WLNI actually started back before covid when I was still in college, I think that's going to be the new BC, right? Before COVID, that's how we're going to start telling time now. <laughs> um, but anyway, I reached out to them because I was at first interested in seeing about an internship while I was still in school, um, whether paid or for credit. So we started um, having a, a progress towards something, and then we all got sent home because of COVID. So they're in Virginia, and I'm in Maryland. Uh, well, I can't really do anything. Um, so in the midst of all of that, WLNI changed hands and the person that I was dealing with, who was the program director at the time that I first started talking with him, had been moved to sales. And the uh, management of the station had been taken over by these other people, Mary, Brian, and this other guy, Rich. Um... So I had to kind of start from square one, but I did. And this is kind of a um, story of consistency or going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so I reached out to them again and then had an interview and then waited a while and then had another interview and uh, then had a third interview, and, uh, and then finally they decided to uh, have me come in person and spend some time with them where I really got immersed in um, everything that they do and how they work. Um, and the result of all of that was that I um, was offered a part-time position uh, with WLNI, uh, 
working with them on production and booking guests and call screening, uh, occasionally doing uh, newscasts maybe. So that would be the closest thing to my voice being on the air, little, you know, 90 second top of the hour newscasts or uh, you know, possibly hearing my voice on promos and stuff. But um, anyway, as far as um, advice, I don't know if I can give much because I'm so new. Uh, the The closest thing I can get to that is uh, the thing about a lot of industries, but definitely the media, is that they might act like they're stonewalling you. Um, you might be in a conversation with them and you're in progress and then all of a sudden they're just they've just disappeared and they're out of contact with you and you're like what's going on that happened to me a few times and um if that happens what i had to do and what anybody who wants to do this might have to do is just keep following up with them um and possibly find a contact with them who isn't in the management team and reach out to them and say, hey, can you do me a favor and um, remind this person that I still exist and to please email me or call me or whatever? So... It's just kind of a consistency thing. And then also, um, as far as blindness is concerned, be as resourceful as you can. Uh, the biggest obstacle that I found while I was there in person was they asked me if I had any experience with the uh, software that they used or that they use to do all their audio editing. Well, turns out the thing is inaccessible. Um, so I wanted to do some research on that before I totally discounted it. So I did and then got back to them and uh, all that research confirmed what I thought I already knew, which was I can't use the thing. So the solution I gave them was let's try to do this. If I go into the production studio and record something, then can somebody email me the file I just recorded and then I take it out to my laptop and use an accessible audio editor that I have more experience with, do the production of it, and then send it back to you guys. And Mary's response to that was, well, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you know, I don't really care what you use as long as the uh, produced product works. So uh, resourcefulness is key in uh, any area of, uh, of life, especially when you're blind and you're dealing with technology, which may or may not be accessible, but especially um, in areas like that, when the whole uh, company or the whole station or whatever it is, has decided on a single program to use you find the thing is inaccessible and you're stuck until you can find a workaround. I think what really stands out to me, I think the lesson here is you, you have to be persistent. Yeah. And you, you have to maintain, you have to maintain, maintain some, some traction with people. You have to follow up and just be, be persistent until you get there. It also seems to me, 
<clears throat> that you are someone who has always wanted to work in this field. So you know I what I did one time? You were talking about persistence. Yeah. Persistence sometimes um, includes an element of creativity. You know what I did one time was um, when I couldn't get a hold of anybody, I actually called into their morning show one time because I had a legitimate comment, but also yeah. to remind Brian and Mary that I was still around. And so I got on the air and what that led to was Mary saying, is that who I think it is? Mm -hmm. And then she called me <clears throat> after the show. And she's like, you're the one who just called the show today, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I had a similar experience <clears throat> interviewing someone on this, on this podcast too. Um, she's a, uh, it's um, she's a Mexican woman who has a tremendous influence in in Latin America and Spanish culture, oh, and cool. she, she she's already been on the show. Um, by the time this airs, you will have already heard the episode. But by the time that I'm sitting recording with you, the episode hasn't aired. But anyway, it's very true. Sometimes you have to kind of you have to be a little a little pesty. Yeah, you have to be a little pesky, and. Mm -hmm. Uh, I noticed that this particular content creator was not responding to me. And then eventually I figured out, well, I got to go talk to her on Clubhouse. Well, the first time I talked oh, to her on Clubhouse. Thought. Yeah, first time I, t very similar to what you did. First time I talked to her on Clubhouse, she was a little confused at first. And then I said, hey, can I give myself a plug? And I said, you know, this is Aaron Richmond from Aaron's Opinion. Um, you know, here's what I do. By the way, everybody else, buddy, everybody else in the group, I really enjoyed the conversation talking about the different disability issues around the world. And I said, and by the way, um, and I said, you know, by the way, Anna, I would love it if, you know, you would, you would come to my podcast. Well, she didn't really know who I was. She's like, okay, whoever you are, you know, uh, <laughs> good, good, good to know. Good to know. Well, I persisted. And I called back on the second show that she did and said the same thing. And then eventually she finally said, I'm sorry I didn't recognize you before, but I definitely want to be your guest. So that's cool. really that's really what you have to do with some of these people. And sometimes a lot of it is <clears throat> that people just get so overwhelmed with the messages. I mean, you, even even you too, you know, if I hadn't called you and realized that, you know, and even last night when I was thinking, well, you know, between you and I, uh, it seemed to me that you, in all honesty, were having a hard time seeing how many times I had been messaging you on your live on your live videos, right? So I figured it occurred to me. I figured there is no way, there is no way in hell that I'm going to get Chris Nussbaum here on Aaron's opinion unless I call him, unless I mm -hmm. unless I unless <laughs> I become a pest. You aren't you aren't you're going to continue to 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 do the behavior that I don't want you to do, which is to to accidentally ignore me. So sometimes in life you got to get a little bit aggressive, but yeah. but it's tricky because you have to do it in a very coy and a very kind way or else it's just annoying and then they just would never talk that to you. That was so something tricky. I actually yeah. asked Mary when uh, <laughs> or actually not Mary um 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 oh I'm blanking on his name. Well, you um, can call him Bob. Uh, no, uh, uh, Tommy, the guy who produces the sports show on WLNI. Okay. Um <laughs> because he books a lot of guests for them. And I said, how many times do you contact a guest you really want for an interview before to, to book them before you become a jerk? That's and, interesting um, because you basically do some of these. It's like pulling teeth, getting people to come to this podcast. It really, I mean, you were, you were pretty nice about it. Actually. I called you late at night. You were pretty willing, but some other guests say, please, 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 yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And what he said, and, and what he said was um, that, like you said, you have to be persistent with them. But he said, um, sometimes, especially if they're really big names, you have to, and they're getting a lot of requests, call them or email them, wait a few days, then call them again, because by then they'll forget that you called them the first time and they won't think you're a jerk. Right. That's another trick to waiting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, you might have to use the same tactic 
a few times, but eventually they'll be like, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, or you can tease something else that you're doing on your show and you, you can be like, hey, listen to this. And then they'll eventually say, oh, hey, that's cool. Um, maybe I should do this too. Um, that's something I had to um, deal with when we interviewed um, Lori because WPOC is now owned by iHeartMedia, which used to be Clear Channel. They're freaking huge. Um, they're the biggest uh, conglomerate in all of uh, radio, and they're one of the biggest conglomerates in all of media. So um, it's really hard to get anywhere with them. Um, so <laughs> what I did was I actually had to go through a few layers before I could even get to her. So what I did was I called the station and I couldn't talk to her, but I told the receptionist what I wanted to do. And she said, well, yeah, you'll have to talk to somebody in promotions and she'll be the go between, between, um, you and Lori. And, you know, my first thought is I don't want to go between. Um, and <laughs> so I was like, all right, I'll jump through the hoops. And so I emailed this lady and, um, then she passed me on to somebody else and then i got an email from her and i kept uh you know going through that hoop um and <laughs> eventually um uh, eventually what i did was um i ended up finding her because i knew they were all working remotely she put her cell phone number in her email signature so when she when like two weeks had passed and she hadn't responded to an email i found that number in my signature or in her signature rather and i texted her and then she was like how did you get that and i said in your email signature um but anyway my email told you know the whole personal story behind it and then you know, of my whole personal story and then told about what that podcast is and who uh, some of the people were that they had interviewed in the past and then what we wanted to do. Um, and eventually, once we jumped through all the hoops, they were like, yeah, let's do it. So then we got it and it was a lot of fun. I think, yeah, yeah. And I have discovered that the guests that you have to jump through the hoops to get to are the guests that you want. So that's, yeah. that ends up being a great, and it was, it was, it was incredibly exciting when this one particular woman who I had been, you know, trying to contact through Clubhouse and messages on Clubhouse and then finding a WhatsApp, WhatsApp didn't work and try it again. And then she eventually got her to, to send me the WhatsApp. Of course, then she admitted that she has three different WhatsApps. So it was of course no she does. <laughs> Right, which which makes which explains why people yeah people I mean I actually have two WhatsApps I have a professional WhatsApp and a private WhatsApp but but then there are these people that have three and four different lines well if you get enough WhatsApps going you can't tell wh WhatsApp you can't tell where the up is up <laughs> uh, so sometimes guys the point is that both Chris and I are making is a lot of the time some of these things are done completely unintentionally and you just have to be coy you have to be kind. And, and firm and you and, and you have to you have to take ownership in your content and you have to believe the the trick to podcasting and it must be a trick because a after we record today I'm going to eat lunch I'm going to teach a student and then I'm going to interview someone else all the way from the UK so Whoa. so something the trick here is that something that I'm doing is working or else I wouldn't have the guests so that's the trick to take ownership and believe in your content believe in you and if you continue to do that, Chris, I promise that you're probably going to be one of the hosts of the morning show for sure at some <laughs> at some point. Well, uh, thank you, but I'm not sure if I want that time slot because I spent that whole morning. Um, um, hmm. I should say about me, I am not a morning person. Oh. So I spent that. So I spent that whole morning being like, how do you guys do this every day? 
Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they're like, it's, it's mm, a lot. We just do it, man. Um, and I made the mistake. I came in in the afternoon the first day because they wanted me to sit in on the sports show, which uh, it's called the Sports Line, which is on from 5 to 7 p.m. So I came in at like 1. Um, and so I was doing that. And then um, Mary asked me to come back two days later, and I made the mistake of saying, what time do you want me there? And she said, oh, let's do 7. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> as in 700 um, as in 7 in the morning mm -hmm. yes yeah, yeah 7 in the morning um but it was a good experience even though uh wake <laughs> waking up at 5:30 or 6 or whatever i i think i set my alarm for 5:30 that was rough yeah. but it yeah. was a good experience Sure. There's more, a lot of those people on the morning shows, a lot of them get up at three in the morning, two or three in the morning, just to be in the studio oh, yeah. easily. It wouldn't oh, surprise yeah. me if they both got up at two, thirty or three each morning oh, yeah. to be oh, able yeah. to produce that for you. So yeah, that, that make that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But then of course there are shows, sometimes they host shows at night too on station. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. late night people that then have to do the same thing, sleep during most of the day so that they can be most productive at night. So it, yeah. it depends on, you know, who you are and, and stuff yeah. like that. So this is this is all all incredible. And I'm, I'm so just so happy to know that, you know, WLNI is, is supportive of you and they're being kind to you. And that that means everything to me to know that another blind person is is succeeding along with me and that it, it really is important. And that whether you remember it or not, Chris, a lot of blind people around us are struggling immensely to find even an internship or work or sure. anything. So the fact that this station, um, I mean, I already love this station just because of the way that they're treating you. It makes me want, it makes me want to call the morning show, you know? <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna, it. I'm gonna have to. You know what? I, I'm gonna, we're gonna have to get your schedule. I need to know when you're working the the, the screen board, because I'm, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to make you sweat a little bit. You know? Hey, there you go. They would. I mean, they would love to hear it from somebody from out of town. Well, well, but 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 you know what the miracle of of radio is? They you could get a call from another country because all oh, radio yeah. stations are online. There's no out of town. It, it's WLNI can be anyone's station, so you mm -hmm. might screen a call Definitely. from another country. It doesn't it doesn't happen often, but I'm sure it does happen, especially with the on the major stations. I yeah. was listening to a guy in um, Dallas, WBAP, uh, right? Probably uh, no. Um, um, KSKY. Oh, you, th this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark mm -hmm. Davis on yeah. um, you know, KSKY. It's the Salem station, 660 The Answer. And uh, I was listening to him. He got, it was during the Olympics. He got a guy, he got a, a call from a guy in Japan. Not a reporter, not anything scheduled, just a guy who was there and was observing stuff, you know, from the ground. And he got he just got a call from Japan, some guy who was listening. That's incredible. Online. That's that's that show that proves that that radio and podcasting, it's all a global, a universal experience for sure. Yes. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Well that's that's really good. That's really good. So where are things going, you know, going from here moving forward for you? What do you think you're gonna end up end up doing? So the uh, only obstacle now is that uh, in order to move there from where I am right now in Maryland, um, I need to find something else, uh, something, uh, another part-time gig uh, to support all the expenses of living and moving and all that stuff. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm dealing with that and putting in application after application after application. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's going forward and, you know, the job search is on, 
um, in all kinds of communication related fields uh, or positions, whether that's, you know, marketing or, um, you know, digital producing for companies or PR or <clears throat> whatever, whatever it is. Um, and so I'm just, you know, putting in stuff for whatever piques my interest. Um, and some stuff in the accessibility field too, by the way. So a lot of that is going on. Uh, also, uh, I'm you know, doing that from home and my uh, mom and stepdad have, uh, and I have actually moved into an RV. We did that this summer. And uh, so we are um, going south for the winter. We're doing what I've been calling the migratory bird thing. We're, we're going uh, to this uh, campground uh, down in um, Georgia. Um, and so the, the thing is, um, I'll be, you know, looking for stuff while, you know, while in transit and while, you know, starting to do that. And so uh, what's likely going to happen is that um, this stuff is going to start actually working after the first of the year. Well, that's that's excellent. That's excellent. And, you know, I really think that as more things are online, I think that a day will come where you could be in Georgia and working for WLNI right over your laptop. I mean, I don't think that, you would need to necessarily, eventually it'll get to a point of sophistication where you can be anywhere in the world working for any station. Oh, that's true. And definitely there are uh, more and more people who are broadcasting remotely. Uh, the thing is that they are at, at this stage of their, uh, operation they're a small station with kind of limited resources and the way they do it is because they have a small staff they're very collaborative and it's not just them anybody who's familiar with the radio industry knows that um, it's good to have everybody or at least most people in the uh, same space generally who are working together on stuff um so you know usually there is a, a home base um so the way that they're structured right now uh for better or for worse for me uh fully remote work just wouldn't be feasible at this time would it work in the future maybe but um, for them, no, not at this time. And even, quite honestly, after spending some time with them, even if they did, I wouldn't really want to. I would want to be in that environment. Sure, of course. Right, right. And what can you tell our listeners about Lynchburg as a city? So... As I mentioned, I went to the University of Lynchburg uh, for four years and graduated uh, from there. And I didn't expect to, but I fell in love with the community. Um, it's just a wonderful place. Um, it's a small town atmosphere, but it's a it, it's enough that there's plenty of um, activity, there's transportation available, uh, you know, uh, rest, plenty of restaurants and stores and stuff available, things to do, places to be. Um, there's plenty of things uh, available on and off the college campuses um, some around the country might be familiar with liberty university which is a big christian university that is uh, located in lynchburg so there's a lot of stuff affiliated with them 
Um, so, but I mean, overall, the the people are great. The community's great. Uh, it's just a it's just an awesome uh, town, <clears throat> and I I really enjoy it, which is uh, why I uh, have uh, been interested in going back there. And I found during the time that I was home for COVID reasons that it wasn't just the people at school that I was missing, but it was Lynchburg itself that I was missing. And so I thought, all right, I guess that's telling me something. So that was when I decided to reach back out to WLNI. Yeah, yeah. That's really that's really, really incredible that you that you're having such a good experience. It seems just I mean, just based on the way that WLNI is treating you, it just makes me it just makes me love love Lynchburg. Mm -hmm. um, not, not that I not that I've been there, but it, you know, it, it says a lot. It, it really says a lot about the community when you have great people in it like that. Yeah. So apparently yeah. those, those are the, I mean, the, these types of people, these Marys and Brian's and WLNI's, these are the types of people that I want here on Aaron's opinion. And these are the types of people that, that blind people should be talking to and should be supportive of because we have a tremendous problem in the community right now of, of finding people who are genuinely supportive in an appropriate way and, and in the right way. And this is a big problem. So the fact that they're so supportive says everything. Yeah. So you know, I, uh, yeah. as we're recording this, we're in the middle of October, which has been known for a long time as Meet the Blind Month. It uh, is right. now... Uh, the name has now been changed this year. It's now becoming known as BEAM, uh, Blind, let's see if I get this right, Blind Equality Achievement Month. And um, there's been a lot of focus placed this month, at least by the National Federation of the Blind, which I'm very active in, on employment and the wide variety of fields that uh, blind people are in which is great and it's really awesome to find uh, the variety uh, of work that blind people can do and spotlight that but it's equally true to recognize the fact that there's still a 70 percent unemployment rate among blind people and the fact that uh, blindness is still uh, an object of, of misinformation and low expectations among people, including employers, is still a big hurdle that uh, blind people have to deal with and overcome in uh, the job search process. Uh, I, I fully recognize the fact that I've been in this experience very fortunate to work with the people that I've worked with who have approached blindness the way they have, which is to say that they haven't seen it as an issue. Okay. Well, I couldn't have thought of a better way to end the episode. But you know how I end every episode. I end it, and as you know, I'm sure you've been listening, so you know how I end the episode, right? I'm going to say, Chris, if you can ask me only one question to really make me sweat to see if I'm really worth my salt as a podcaster, what do you want to ask me? Oh, man. Only one question now. I think the um, I think the the biggest question that I would ask you is what what makes you decide or what um, determines for you who you want to 
have a conversation with on your podcast? What determines it for me is how kind the, the guest is, how persistent the guest is, and how successful the guest is. And right. if you're a strong person and the right guest, you'll be on this podcast. Very that's good. all I can say. And that's, and that's something that all of us should strive for. Chris Nussbaum, it really has been a pleasure and an honor to speak to you. By the way, you haven't lost me so easily. You are forever welcome on Aaron's Opinion. And that's a promise I can keep. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. It's been a pleasure. It's been a lot of fun to be here. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Always welcome. All right, everybody. Take care. And as I like to say in the outro, but I'll say it here just for fun in the recording, help one person today, help a million people tomorrow.